you know, what areas are you putting your properties in specifically? Are they like A class areas, B class, C class? Um, I look, I try and say B and A. Um, you know, A is an interesting one to point out, especially in Portland right now, because yeah. you'd normally point to the Pearl and Slab Town, like, oh, those are A. And they are A, they just are dealing with some uh, some issues. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what we focus on is on the North Northeast Portland side. We love Mississippi District, mm. Alberta Arts District, mm -hmm. essentially all the all the I, neighborhoods that you hear of. That's yeah, I grew up to. around uh, Alberta Arts oh, District, gosh, so I yeah. know. I mean, it's it's really crazy changed. how much multifamily is going up there now. It, it's a lot, it's a lot. And what's really interesting, and I just <clears> found this out recently, is the median income in Alberta Arts District. Do you know what it is? Well, I, in Portland, it's like 126 now, right? So what is it in? They were 105, and that to me was pretty freaking high. Wow. For, yeah. uh, for I mean, I mean, that's higher than the average for San Francisco, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 105,000. And so our tenant, uh, our average tenant median income at our 55 units, 100 grand. Mm -hmm. And that to me blew my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but only further reinforced, you know, you hear about all these issues with Portland and being a landlord. When you've got a tenant that's making 100 grand a year, they're paying their rent on time. Hey guys, welcome to the Realize Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. I'm an Oregon and Washington realtor, and I'm a multifamily investor and a short-term rental investor. And I'm your co-host, Jordan Lee, mortgage lender based here in Portland, Oregon, licensed in about eight or nine states, and uh, I invest in single-family homes. And Jordan, uh, who did we have on for episode 44? Oh yeah, this is a super great episode. Uh, actually, a guy I met through a networking and another real estate investing event. Uh, his his name is Michael Hamilton, yeah. and he's a developer. He he started small scale, and he's worked his way up to building. I think their do their sweet spots kind of 60, 65 units. Now. Yeah, it's crazy. And you know the funniest thing is, is that you know I'm more, always telling people don't build in Portland, don't invest in Portland, and he's doing the exact opposite. He's making it work in Portland and doing a pretty good job at it. Yeah, I think he, it's really interesting because it tells the opposite story of what you're hearing in the media. And if you're interested in learning about what it takes to become a developer, uh, this would be a great episode for you to tune into. Hey guys, welcome to episode 44 of the Realized Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. And I'm your co-host Jordan Lee. And we're super excited to have Michael Hamilton on the show today. Uh, I met him at an investor event the other week, and uh, he had a really great story to share. So I thought we'd bring him on and have him share with you. Uh, Michael, do you mind just giving us your background? Like, you know, what, <clears throat> I don't know if you're from the Portland area, or like what brought you here and how you kind of got into what you're doing now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I am from the Portland area. Uh, so my name is Michael Hamilton, uh, co-founder of Seneca Development. Mm. Uh, was actually born in Bellevue, Washington. Okay. Uh, moved down here when I was about six. Okay. And I've been in Portland ever since, so. Well, where did you go to high school? I went to Sunset High School. Sunset, oh, okay. Over on the other side of the hill. Yeah. yeah. And what year were you? Um, 2013. 20, oh, wow. Super recent. Yeah. <laughs> nice, <laughs> well, yeah. 10 years ago now. So. I guess it is yeah, 10 years yeah. ago now. But um, so, so, yeah. And right out of high school, did you like get into real estate or did you go to college or how did you find your how did you find your way there? Yeah. So um, I was good in school and the classes that I cared about. Uh, and then the ones I didn't care about, it wasn't so good. And <laughs> yeah. so I was down in Eugene. I was dual enrolled <clears throat> at Lane Community College in mm -hmm. U of O. Mm -hmm was going into my second year down there uh, and again, did not love school and tried to think, God, how can I make money uh, and good money uh, without a college degree? Mm -hmm. And so I looked at things like getting my broker's license, mm -hmm. uh, being a mortgage broker, mm -hmm. uh, and it eventually led me into like this fix and flip world. And, and I ended up reaching out to, <clears throat> gosh, I don't know, maybe a hundred different uh, people. Uh, and some of them were handymen, some were brokers, some were fix and flippers, and essentially said, hey, I'm really interested in the space. Huh, just people that you knew that were doing it successfully? or uh, Some people I knew. I would say about 75% of it was just, where can I find an email online? Okay, uh, interesting. Of, of someone that is in real estate, and, and how can I kind of get my foot in the door? Mm -hmm. uh, so I did that. Uh, ended up getting a call uh, from a fix and flipper who 
uh, said he needed help on his investment acquisitions team, which I think was a really sexy way of saying, <laughs> I need a cold caller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so being in my second year in college, I'm like, investment acquisitions team, that sounds great. Uh, so I ended up working for that guy for, gosh, I want to say about a year and oh, really wow. quickly uh, learned, gosh, if your construction budget's not on point and your schedule is not on point, it, it eats into your fix and flip return pretty quickly. Uh, so I focused on that and I didn't have any capital, uh, didn't have enough experience to be raising money. So I found out, or I figured out, uh, man, if I can specialize in this construction aspect of it, mm. it would seem very critical uh, in raising money to be able to mitigate risk. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the direction I took. I ended up getting my GC license, and kind of the rest is history. Well, with that first year of doing that cold calling, were you getting paid on a commission basis? How are you making money there? Uh, I wish I was getting paid on a commission basis. <laughs> <laughs> Just minimum wage per hour, right? Uh, absolutely. Oh, wow. No, I think it was about 17 bucks an hour. Oh, that, okay. That's not bad. Yeah, which at the time. For that time, yeah. It, yeah I was like, oh, sweet. This is awesome. Um, and then once you get taxes taken out of it, you're like, mm, I think I'd rather take commission. Yeah. Um, and then, again, I learned a lot from incentive just that alone. It was like after a while, that's why I wanted to go out on my own. I was like, this $17 an hour isn't, isn't anything compared to what uh, that type of effort actually makes an investment. Because you can see the people above you, like what they were doing, the mar their margins. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, well, my phone call just made this guy $100,000 yet. <laughs> I'm going to get 800 bucks this week. Nice. And then, so what was the kind of next step to, because you said you didn't have like that capital. How did you mm -hmm. kind of make that construction world work? You know, um, kind of like I shared with you at our meetup, I, I looked at, hey, where can I get licensed? Frankly, where's the easiest place to get licensed? Is yeah. it Oregon or Washington? Washington didn't require a test. It was, you know, pay a couple hundred bucks for a license and bond and insurance. <laughs> Good and, to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now you could build. And so I was like, okay. Uh, so I went ahead and did that uh, and started from the ground up. I mean, I was on, like, Thumbtack, uh, trying to do small remodel jobs. Thumbtack. Is that just, like, some website that – It's, like, like – contract your Yeah, like, subs or, okay. or more so, like, handymen will go okay. on to just find, like, one-off gigs. So um, it's like TaskRabbit, but for contractors. Exactly, yeah. And uh, try to gain experience in construction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like I told you, my very first remodel that I did, I was putting a wall in between a master bedroom to split it into two, and we managed to do that wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, you don't have to take a test. Who's checking that you're doing anything correct at all or to the permit? Um, the inspector will check. Okay. Um, but after that remodel job, uh, which, again, thank God that it was wrong. I ended up losing money and not a ton of money, but to figure it out and, and get it done correctly. Mm -hmm. um, in my yeah, yeah, what was that? So you told me that it, you, you did it wrong, but what was the process like of going back and fixes it? And how did you find out you did it wrong? Did, like, an inspector come and look at it? or No, didn't even get that far. The owner came in one day while we were working and said, that's not where I want the wall. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're like, okay, where do you want the wall? Uh, and again, this is before any official drawings or anything. You didn't need a permit to actually split the wall. It was just put up the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how we learned is the owner came in and said, that's not what I want. Um, and we went ahead and fixed it. I want to say we lost a couple thousand bucks doing it. Uh, but from then on out, uh, I started just hiring subcontractors under me. I okay. realized, like, wait a minute, I don't have to get the team together. I just need to hire a subcontractor to perform the work that I'm bidding out. Yeah. Um, and so started doing that. So you went from one job to being immediately the GC. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I, I was already licensed to be the GC. Why not? Right, right. Um, and, and so uh, got a really cool opportunity to uh, build a house, starter homes. Um, networking kind of the same way that we met uh found a developer that was just getting started looking mm. for a contractor said hey i'm just getting started my costs are really low yeah. maybe we can benefit each other uh and started building for him and built a really good relationship with him uh he started growing from doing uh, like five six hundred thousand dollar starter homes uh he had a good backing of capital so very quickly he started doing three four five million dollar luxury houses mm. up in mercer island uh medina neighborhood in bellevue and i did one of those projects for him and quickly <coughs> was like hey if we're spending four million dollars on a house why don't we try doing apartments or six units or 12 units and um i said i'm from portland much cheaper down there it's a it's a growing growing city so i brought him down he loved it uh, ended up finding an entitled piece of land for 18 units. 
uh, which at the time our budget to do that project was one and a half million. Mm. Uh, so it was my first million dollar contract. Um, did that project for him and just networked from there. And, and again, wow. at this point, I hadn't developed anything. So it was just a contractor. Just as the general contractor. Yeah. yeah. So that's amazing to me that you went from like not really doing a ton of jobs to like building a whole house, <laughs> which, which to me just goes to show like, a lot of people, when they get into their career, especially our career, they're like, oh, you got you to gotta have a ton of experience, otherwise you're never going to sell a home. But it, it's not necessarily true. Like, you got to just meet the right people, and mm-hmm. you got to be confident, and you got to be able to find the right people to do the work right. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, it, it, you know, it comes with risk, uh, not being an expert and jumping into something like this, but... Not uh, being afraid to fail, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. As long as you're, you can stomach that, that sort of failure, and quote... Uh, and not give up on it, I, th- I think it's pretty easy to persevere through. Mm. And so then you went from building like super nice custom homes to suddenly you jumped into multifamily. Um, and then is that just kind of never looked back from that or? Yeah, there were, there were a lot of things that made me not want to look back. Uh, one of which is a custom home. You know, it's like the things like how the handle works or you know, what little corners of, uh, of a room look like are really important. Uh, but when you're doing multifamily, it's a lot more of production building. Oh, yeah. uh, not to say there's not quality involved in it, um, but your tenant uh, isn't going to rent based on the color of the backsplash. Yeah, right. right? Uh, so that was nice. And then also the type of client you have. Uh, I, I, w- I would say that residential seems to be a lot more emotional. Again, mm-hmm. it's like you're thinking about the colors of things and, hey, what's going to get this guy's wife to really tell him he needs to buy this house versus with renters, they look at two or three units and they go, yeah, we'll go ahead and sign a lease here. Um, So those were two things that I looked at that that really made me want to push forward on on the multifamily side. And did you find that in terms of like, you know, permitting and contracts and legal stuff, was it the multifamily space more challenging than the residential space or? Um, Challenging, you know, when you're first (coughs) learning about it, there's a lot more that goes into it, I would say, maybe on the structure side. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like at that point when when uh, developers are raising money for, for multifamily deals, they're doing pref structures or waterfall structures. Yeah, what go? can you elaborate on that a little bit for yeah. our viewers, what that means? Absolutely. So if I'm a developer and you're an investor that wants to develop uh, in a multifamily project, we'll set up some sort of structure where you get... Uh, like an 8% preferred return on your money. Okay. Uh, and then from there, once that preferred return is hit, it starts waterfalling down to us. That's when we start making money on Okay, so you're incentivized to keep the, co- that helps you incentivize the cost being low. Cost low and perform. And, and speed or and performance, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like you, you don't, as a uh, multifamily developer, want to be aggressive with your pro formas mm-hmm. because yeah. the more conservative you are, the better chance that you as the developer are actually going to see a return on it. Right. Uh, whereas with when you're aggressive, you don't hit the metrics, you could build something and be waiting seven years before you even see anything because oh, yeah. you're so aggressive, you're not even hitting your returns for your investors. Right. Um, we're on the residential side, it's mu- much more cut and dry. Mm-hmm. Um, you kind of know what you're going to make. You know what you're going to make. It's a lot shorter time period. Uh, but, you know, you ask about permitting. That was another reason why we wanted to stick with multifamily. You know, permitting uh, a six-unit building, for instance. Uh, I'm just going to use that as, as an example. A six-unit sure. building and a hundred-unit building, it requires the same permitting process. Oh, interesting. Right. Okay. Um, and so in, in Portland specifically, there'll be certain uh, neighborhoods or districts that have design review districts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they require land use approvals, mm-hmm. um, but it's not something that you can necessarily circumvent just by doing a smaller project. Okay. And so when we looked at it, we're like, hey, if we're going to spend a year designing, sometimes a year and a half designing and permitting, We'd rather do it with 100 units versus six units. I mean, that's a huge investment. How did you vet out these projects and their location and feel like I'm gonna we're gonna make money on this? Like, what 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 are good criteria for you to say that this is a successful deal? Yeah. So I again, I was lucky on being on the construction side, being able to build for so many different developers in Portland and see uh, where their projects were landing, what's what sort of lease up they were experiencing. Um, that really helped me understand the landscape of what areas we wanted to invest in was simply learning from the developers that I was building for. Um, and then being able to, at a certain point, financially model those projects myself. That's how I started practicing and understanding, you know, how do we hit these returns? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not kind of like when I, I spoke with you last week, it's not just, you know, plugging in six numbers in a calculator and saying this deal makes sense. Right. 
And so learning those models and also using the experience we had building really gave us a grasp on where certain assets would perform. Okay, and at this point you said you got your contractor's license initially in Washington, you're building in Portland, Multnomah County, right? Yeah, point. so uh, I had not actually gotten my license. What I had done in uh, city of Portland is I got an RMI, essentially it's a, another license contractor that puts their liability <coughs> on you so you can perform while you get your contracting license. Uh, so I only did that for about a year. Okay. Uh, I had met enough contractors and subcontractors that were licensed like, right. like I was in Washington <coughs> here in Oregon um, and was able to just pay a small fee, let me use their license right, right. with our company name and then eventually we got licensed in Oregon. And can mm. you explain to our audience what RMI stands for? Uh, responsible Managing partner or individual, I guess okay. is what that stands for. Yeah. So it seems like there's ways to kind of get around things if yeah. you need to. Yes. And you know, when you're using your RMI, are they, are you basically talking through them to get the subcontractors or how does that work? Um, no, it is simply filling out a piece of paper, filing it with the CCB so that they know that this specific, specific license number is associated with this it's, new LLC. And then I write contracts and communicate like any other GC. It's basically like choosing who's liable, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and like I said, about a year went by, studied. It's an open book test. So once mm -hmm. I real and I didn't know that at the time, so I really <coughs> studied for this test and then sat down to take the test. I was like, oh, take your book out. I was like, <laughs> man, I could have had this a year ago. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and and so now at this point, you 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 you, you talked about doing six units. You talked about doing hundreds of units. What is there some kind of sweet spot that you found that works well in this area or? Something that you're focusing on? Yeah, that's a really good question, because uh, there is. And, and we really feel like we've tapped into a little space <clears throat> of the market that uh, we've got a little bit of leverage in, a mm. little bit of um, pretty much anything from about 30 to about 75 units. It's, it's in this world where 30 units is sometimes a little bit larger than uh, the typical uh, side gig investor. Right. You know, someone that's got a full-time job looking to buy multifamily. 30 units is up there. Um, and then we noticed that about 60 units, and it's come down a little bit, is where you start getting into institutional buyers, okay. right? private equity groups. Okay. And So we, those are like the more serious, more conservative investors. And they're the guys that will pay a lower cap rate uh, for a building because they're putting out so much capital. Right. Um, and so we like to be in that space of about 50, 60 units. We're doing a 27 unit right now. Uh, the other two projects that we have going through design and permitting, one's a 68, 172. Those are the perfect spot for us, mm. um, primarily because we're our own construction company. So in Oregon, uh, Portland specifically, there's a handful of general contractors that can actually perform that type of work. <clears throat> right, because you're not just the general contractor, you're also the developer. Yes. So you do, you do kind of both of those roles. Yes, absolutely. So we got a separate company uh, that does the development and then a separate one that actually is licensed. We hire that company to perform the construction work. Mm. Um, and the benefit being uh, we don't charge ourselves what um, like a Seabold would charge or, or one of those big name contractors. We're able to kind of take that off at the top. Obviously, we still sustain the construction company and, sure. and, and make money on it. Uh, but that's given us a lot of control in those types of projects. And then what do you for architecture? Do you just you hire that out, though? Okay. Yep. Yep. Hire out the design and hire out the property management. And hire out property management, okay. Yep. And they take care of the lease up and everything. Yep, yeah. I always make the joke that <coughs> once we're done with construction, I don't even want to look at a building anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. it's up when you have to go refinance out or whatever, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So I, I do want to ask, since you're subbing out the work and you're subbing out the architecture, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis at your role? That's a great question. Um, I always make the joke, it depends where the fire's at. Yeah. Mm. Um, but every day is different. That's really why I like real estate is very rarely are you doing the same things every day. Mm -hmm. um, very rarely are you having the same conversations. Um, you know, days like today, uh, before we had this meeting, uh, I was with my partners and we were reviewing a pro forma for a project uh, that we just finalized raising all the capital for. Mm -hmm. Just doing one more pass through the pro forma. Um, and then we're moving from schematic design with our architect into construction design. Uh, and so after this, we'll be reviewing our final schematics and just making unit changes, seeing if we can increase unit count. Um, 
And tomorrow's different. I'm golfing for half the day. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, are is it still is it hard for you to find capital? Still, are you still like hunting, or or is it like you just have this pool of investors that you've worked with, and they they can kind of come back to you because they've seen your track record? Yeah. Um, I, I say we're always looking for deals and we're always looking for capital. Yeah. Uh, you know, development takes such a long time, you know, yeah. from start to finish three years from when you find a project to when you actually start making money on it. It means you've always got to be looking for a project. Um, and so when you're always looking for a project, you're always looking for capital. I've found uh, word of mouth goes a long way. Um, and then proof of track record too. You know, it's like raising my first million dollars before I had finished our 55 unit building felt impossible right uh going into this year i think we've raised about eight million and it's been easier than raising the one i think a lot of that just has to do with being able to perform and show that you can perform on projects like this mm. Mm. and typically when you're underwriting these deals how many investors are you i mean it seems like you'd only want to bring in one if possible but yes are sometimes you having to do like when you started, were you having to syndicate it out to like 10, 15 people, or did you never go that model? No, never went that model, uh, primarily because that was something I learned from the developers I was working for. Hearing them raise, you know, 50 grand or 200 grand for a project that required $5 million of equity, hearing them talk to 25 different investors, all these memos, and again, we communicate really well with our investors, but <coughs> it seemed like a lot of cooks in the kitchen to manage. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was something we weren't interested in. We don't want to be money managers. You know, mm -hmm. we want to invest in development. And so trying to find that fine line, uh, and it definitely narrows your investor pool, right? right? A lot more people got 50 grand than have $3 million. Right. Um, but at the same time, something I've noticed is having an educated investor, especially in these types of projects, helps a lot. Having mm -hmm. someone that doesn't really understand the investment uh, can sometimes be time consuming. Right, right, yeah, yeah, if you have to bring them through the whole process. Yeah, and, and answer questions like, oh, why are you guys doing this? Why are you doing this? I mean, I, you know, I hear about a lot of these syndications when you are one of those smaller $50,000 investors. They they call them silent investors because you're not allowed to go on, <laughs> you know, to the construction side and ask questions and make decisions because you're supposed to just get your cut at the end. Yes. Like your, your payout, and then yeah. you're done. So, <laughs> yeah, we're the opposite. I mean, I, I always invite our investors out. I invite them to come to design meetings. Because these are more like partners, right? I mean, they're yeah. putting in a few million dollars or exactly. something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and reality is they come to a couple design meetings and they go, <laughs> 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 you guys do it. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, like you were mentioning, you're doing like, what, 50 units. Like, how much design do they really want to have input? Like, Exactly. <laughs> and, and even I don't want to have design input. So <laughs> I try to leave that to the experts. Right. Yeah. Well, I, well, you know, what areas are you putting your properties in specifically? Are they like A class areas, B class, C class? Um, I look, I try and say B and A. Um, you know, A is an interesting one to point out, especially in Portland right now, because yeah. you'd normally point to the Pearl and Slab Town, like, oh, those are A. And they are A. They just are dealing with some uh, some issues. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what we focus on is on the north, northeast Portland side. We love Mississippi District, mm. Alberta Arts District. Mm -hmm. Essentially, all the all the I, neighborhoods that you hear of. That's yeah, I grew up around uh, Alberta Arts. Oh district, gosh, so I yeah. know. I mean, it's, it's completely crazy changed. how much multifamily is going up there now. It, it's a lot. It's a lot. And what's really interesting, and I <coughs> just found this out recently, is the median income in Alberta Arts District. Do you know what it is? Well, I, in Portland, it's like one twenty six now, right? So what is it in? There were one hundred five, and that to me was pretty freaking high. Wow. For yeah. uh, for I mean, I mean that's well, higher than the average for San Francisco, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one hundred five thousand, and so our tenant. Uh, our average tenant median income at our 55 units, 100 grand. And mm. that to me blew my mind. Mm. Um, but only further reinforced, you know, you hear about all these issues with Portland and being a landlord. When you've got a tenant that's making 100 grand a year, they're paying their rent on time. Oh, yeah. They don't want, I mean, they don't want their credit dinged or yep. all this stuff. Like, yep. they didn't work that hard to, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to not pay on time. You know? Exactly. Now, speaking of that, so. And I'm not super familiar with this, but I, I understand in Portland there's a restriction put on a after 20 units, right? <coughs> you you have to build a portion of it to be affordable. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah. Can so you talk to our, our listeners a little bit about that and how you've incorporated that into our, your business model? Because I know when that came out, everyone's like, oh, screw this. I'm out of Portland, like, and no one's going to build here anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's called inclusionary housing. I want to say in 2017, it came into effect. Mm -hmm. And like you said, uh, as a builder, if you're building more than 20 units, 20% 20 of those units have to be affordable to 80% area median income. Okay. Or uh, I want to say it's 10%. Which is pretty high. 80% is like not that low. That's not crazy. Yeah. No. 
uh, or the other option is 10% at 60% area, me area median income. Okay. And uh, again, a huge reason why we like North Portland, Northeast Portland is you don't really hit those rent thresholds. Oh, yeah. Right. So if, I gave an example. It's like if you're building the Ritz Carlton, your one bedroom's renting out for 3000 5000 right. <laughs> Really hard for you to incorporate 20% of those at $1,700 a month for a one bedroom. Mm -hmm. Where the type of product we build, 1700s right in that bucket. It fits really well. Um, and then actually capping those rents too, right? It's like, well, you know, you're, you're, you've dedicated those. There's a covenant against your property that 20% of those units will be affordable. Um, but they do a very similar rent increase that's, that state of Oregon does. So last year, inclusionary housing units rent went up 12% mm -hmm. year over year. And we, you, we've never raised rents 12%. Right. I mean, you can't anymore uh, with the yeah, SB now it's 10. 611 that yeah. uh, just passed. Yeah. yeah. But still, 10, well, 10, 10, is 10. 10 is still like a lot. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've never gotten close to raising If, if, if rents 10. went up 10% over year over year, like, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're hitting home runs. And, yeah. No, I think we're closer to like 2.5%, 3.5%. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. On obviously existing tenants. And yes. When you have turnover, yeah, get it to market. Do whatever totally. you want. But. It, and does that like change the way you have to design things or do anything weird? <clears> um, yeah. Actually, it does. Uh, and there's a. I would say there's a balance between uh, the size of your unit, right? So tenants don't rent on price per square foot. Yet us as developers and investors, that's how we analyze That's how we build and, and analyze and invest, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we try and find that balance of how do we get the unit price for this size unit and then maximize that price per square foot. And uh, every neighborhood's different. Uh, give an example like uh, Ar Arbor Lodge. I always say the most profit profitable size one bedroom you can do is about 530, 550 square feet. It's the most okay. profitable. Any larger, your price per square foot starts to drop. Any smaller, it's pretty difficult to make it attractive it's as a tight. one bedroom. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Someone that's paying like fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars a month, they, whether their thing's 50 or square feet bigger or smaller, they don't really care, right? Or they, they don't notice. Yeah, yeah. Or they don't. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Hmm. Interesting. Um, can you talk about the property management side of things once you finish? You, like, who's managing your properties? What's going on there? Yeah, so we use Coast Property Management. Uh, they're a nationally recognized property manager. Um, they're awesome. I mean, they're mm. phenomenal. Uh, on our lease up, on our 55 unit, uh, I think it took them two and a half months of pre-leasing to get a 50% pre-leased, mm. and then about another two and a half, three months to get it fully pre-leased. Um, and they're phenomenal with being able to look at the unit matrices and kind of decide when rents need to move up or down based on demand. Um, but the best part is the operational side. I mean, I always make a point to people when they're like, oh, you own real estate in Portland and Oregon. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like, I don't deal with any of it. <laughs> you know, it's like we actually had like three weeks after we had finished the building, one of our tenants had a kitchen fire. Mm. They're, they're making fish sticks, and instead of putting them in the oven, they – put a bucket of oil or a pan of oil on top of the stove and it created a fire. We got a phone call at 10 o'clock at night and that was the last of us handling it. The rest was the property manager finding the contractors mm -hmm. to fix the building yep. and, and, and get it released and working with our insurance company. Oh yeah. So it really frees us up to be able to outsource that and not have to do it in house. Mm. And, and when you're building those like 55, 60 type units, at what do you, do you have to put in like a bunch of like stuff for common like services, like gyms, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah at so what point does that become like the, you know, needed part? Yeah, so uh, every zoning has different requirements. <coughs> uh, mm. Meeting certain requirements dictates, you know, setbacks and dedications. Okay. Uh, so every project's different. Right. Uh, one of our philosophies, uh, you know, driving around Williams um, in Mississippi and noticing a lot of empty retail, Mm -hmm. or a lot of, uh, I almost call it like the hospital, where you walk into a building and they've got white walls and they've got a gym that no one's in and mm -hmm. it's just very sterile. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're all the crazy monkeys kind of situation. Um, so we decided on both of our 68 unit and our 72 unit building was the ground floor was gonna be completely amenitized as a hotel. So, oh. uh, and when I say hotel, I mean, uh, there's no gym, right. uh, but there's little libraries, there's little study areas. It's very well finished. We spend money on like brick veneer and bamboo and artwork, trying to make it feel like 
walking into the Hoxton hotel, okay. you know, where you walk in, you've got it's like a nice lobby, you sit down and have tea. Exactly. Uh, we'll incorporate uh, like speakeasies. So, you know, hidden rooms on the ground floor Ooh, that, that you can walk fun. into that have like whiskey lockers and that sort of thing. Oh, interesting. Uh, with the idea that people want to show off where they live. Yeah, you right. know, as much as they want a gym or, or a little deck huh, space, that's interesting. We want them to be proud of wh- where their home is. I mean, huh. they, I mean, they move to that area to be a, in a walkable, trendy area. They probably want to walk to their gym or their yoga studio or Orange Theory or whatever exactly. they got. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, oftentimes those like hotel gyms or apartment gyms are just like tiny and don't have what you need anyway. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they've got a, a couple of treadmills. To I was going to say, it's much more man- things to manage, things that break down that you have to take care of. If you have a sauna or a steam room, like that's probably a pain in the ass. So. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Huh, cool. Like, can you talk about just economies of scale? Obviously, you went from like you know building like residential custom houses where you order like one set of cabinets <laughs> versus now you're working obviously on a 50-unit scale. Yeah. Uh, how, how does that... Um, how does that save you? Obviously, you're buying in bulk, so you yes. can talk about that in general. Yes. Yeah, um, man, you save on just about everything. Flooring, mm-hmm. appliance packages. You know, when you buy one kitchen of appliance packages and then you buy $250,000 worth of appliances, you get a discount. Everything's different though. You know, whether it's a 10% discount, a 15, 20%, mm-hmm. and it really depends on the vendor you're going to. Yeah. Uh, we've found that going to more <coughs> ma and pa shops for uh, like countertops and flooring. Yeah. It, huge savings. Interesting. In comparison to going to the big guys. Uh, okay. We use Lands cabinets for all of our cabinets. They're phenomenal. Um, but every aspect changes. Um, I would say we hardly source from the same vendor on every project other than our elevator. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's very niche. Yeah, there's yeah. there's yeah. only a couple in the game for that probably, right? <laughs> yeah, we got a couple options. Yeah. But we moved from this guy to this guy, then back over to him. Uh, but we've got a really good relationship with Schindler. Uh, we've noticed uh, that the more commitments we make to them, our pricing seems to come down. Mm. Um, so it's a good relationship. Huh, cool. Yeah, I guess that vendor world just keeps changing when you get bigger, right? Yeah, and, and there's always new vendors. I mean, every year when we go out and rebid, there's now a new flooring company and, mm-hmm. or, oh, yeah. or, or a new finished carpenter. So we talked a little bit about sourcing funding. Um, what about sourcing land? Do you have like a specific teammate that does that or or is it like you have a few realtors that are kind of know to look for you or? Yeah, man, we've gotten so lucky. Uh, and, it, and it's really been, um, being able to get my foothold in this market as a construction guy helped a ton. Yeah. Um, there's been buildings where I was building a small building, a little 18 unit building, and the neighbor comes over, starts talking to me, and he goes, oh, well, I actually own this house, this house, this house, and this house, <laughs> and they're all renters. I'm like, oh, great. Um, two and a half years later, the guy calls me up, says, hey, I'm moving to Astoria. These are all zoned for you know, mid-rise multifamily. I'm, you know, do you wanna buy all four houses? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't go on the market. Um, and then some of it is is brokers where they'll send us deals. And I say, like I said, always looking for deals. Mm-hmm. But we're so particular with where we invest <clears throat> and the right. type of product that we invest in. We only really dive into making commitments on probably less than 5% of what comes our way. Okay, so you have quite a pool of stuff to choose through. Yeah. And, you're, and you are only – are you going to change the zoning on something when you get it? Or is it like – no. Um, you know, it needs to be already ready to go. It, it needs to be zoned appropriately for what we want to do. Okay. Uh, we look at it like we're already undertaking quite a bit of a burden right. developing. So we look at path of least resistance. Right? Oh, yeah. We don't want to rezone anything. We actually had someone come on here that, that said that that was one of the – a great thing to do was to, like, take land and re-entitle it and get it set up for a developer because they, they don't want to uh, do oh, it. Oh, Tomiko? Uh, yeah, she mentioned that, and I think John Tay mentioned it too. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's attractive. It, it, depending on the type of uh, developer, like someone like us, we're so picky. You know, right. Talking about our amenity space <clears throat> on the ground floor, uh, we really feel like we've got our unit sizes and flow down to a science. Probably would be really hard for us to pick up someone else's project. Yeah, you don't want to take another year, you know, through all the red tape just to have a an empty lot, right? You want to yes. move through it as quickly as possible. And what what is generally like from purchase to you know, starting to build, how long does that usually take with all the perfect conditions? Man, in what world? All the perfect <laughs> conditions. Just saying, all the perfect conditions. <laughs> no, absolutely. You can name all the, the you know, the issues along the way. But. Yeah. 
Um, so a good example is we've got uh, two identical lots right now, the 68 and the 72 unit buildings uh, that we're designing. One required design review, the other one didn't. Mm. Uh, what's that do? Just it because adds. of the code? Yep. Yeah, so there's, again, if you look at a map, there's just like little blobs on mm -hmm. the city of essentially required to go through design review, and then there's types of design review <coughs> you can go through. Uh, so when we're required to do it, we choose a path of least resistance. We try and meet all the community design standards. Uh, that means it's not up to the city or the neighborhood necessarily right. whether it's approved. It's just a commission that says, yeah, that works. It's just like the administrative review. You don't have to exactly. take it to the community. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's, that's nice, yeah. Um, so if you, if you go through that, I would say it's about 15-ish months to get through. Uh, if you don't have to, and you can go straight from your EA meeting, which is the very first meeting you have with the city, your early assistance meeting, uh, to permit approval, uh, depending on your architect, how quickly they can get drawings together, it should be, take about, about a year. Wow. And, the, you know, the fact that you've already built a lot of these building, buildings and you worked with a lot of these people and mm -hmm. you've shown these plans, can, can you just say, we're doing the exact same thing? Here you go. Would that shorten things? <laughs> Wouldn't it? You would think so. <laughs> Gosh. Um, it, it does in terms of the schematic phase where yeah. you're wondering like, gosh, where do we want to put units? What do we right. want the flow of the unit to be? Um, but because every neighborhood and quite literally every block's got a different requirement. I mean, there's like different traffic flow, right? Utilities exactly. are coming from different areas. There's yeah. like different amounts of water that you can handle. It's yes. too many different variables, oh, right? Yeah. Cast shade on this building and make you know <laughs> things look terrible, or et cetera, <laughs> right. I'm assuming, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can. Uh, it makes it easier on the upfront side, but when it comes down to engineering and structural and civil, it's all different per the site. Mm. So if you if you were to recommend to somebody that was like thinking about getting into development on like you know maybe they had some experience in other real estate areas but they were like hey maybe I want to build a duplex or mm -hmm. triplex or what would you what would you say to them on how to get started? Um, man, I'd say the biggest thing, and I think I mentioned this to you last week, was understanding the financial aspect of it. You know, not just year one. Uh, but what happens over the course of 10 years? Mm. What happens with the type of debt that you put on the building? There's a lot of risk involved. And so understanding, at least for me, to make me comfortable with investing in, as a developer was understanding all the things that could go wrong from a financial perspective and stress testing those, right? Understanding what happens when rates go up. What does that do to my takeout financing? Uh, and then I'd say the second most important thing is getting a good team, mm. a good team of designers that understand uh, what your objectives are. A lot of architects, uh, you know, I look at them like artists. Yeah. They really care about the final product. Um, and having one that's also cost conscious, right. I would say that's the biggest thing I hear from developers is, God, I developed this building and now it's 20% over budget. It's like, well, you've got to be able to manage your design team. Right. Yeah. Uh, so having an architect that's on the same page as you is probably number two. Mm. And I mean, with that too, also, I mean, can you tell us about your experience in the last year with interest rates going up? Like crazy? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, man. Um, being in Portland, too, where, where it seems like it's all just kind of shut down all at once. You know, it's like once rates started going up, even though the <coughs> rates weren't that bad, the fear in the marketplace put everything to a halt. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen a lot of projects get stopped. Um, I've seen projects um, get taken back from banks already. Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, a lot of your c competition or, like, whatever, our friends that are doing a similar thing, yep. some of their projects are being stopped, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, well, and some can't even get them financed to start to begin with. You know, when okay. rates went up so much, that changed the capitalization rates. Exactly. Uh, and so when cap rates went up, values went down, and now these projects just don't pencil uh, on paper, which is really difficult and, to manage. And, and for our listeners... It, and I don't know if it might make sense for you to describe this more in detail, but that basically what the, what you're doing is you're making a model based on how much rents you will get, right, versus your loan. And, and as rates go up, mm -hmm. your monthly payment's going to go up, and suddenly for the bank it's like, well, this project might not pencil more or less, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's spot on. While your payment goes up, your ability to actually service that payment gets smaller and completely can go underwater <coughs> where the building's not even making enough money to make the payment. So that means like the margins on a lot of these projects are pretty thin then, right? They are thin. Yeah, they are. It's all, you know, it's all about um, scaling, right? So it's like when you do a 100 unit project, you're not going to hit the same percent margin as you would, uh, you know, a, a two unit building, but you've got 100 units. It's a much larger volume. Um, 
and, and what I've seen happen now is a lot of people having to plug more capital into their project to get that debt down so it can be serviced by today's rates. Mm. And so deals that required $4 million now require $7, 8000000 million. That Which changes, is a huge difference. Oh, yeah. And it changes the return for the initial capital, too. Right. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and how have you managed to negotiate that? Is it, I mean, a combination of your being vertically integrated in, integrated in the sense that you have developer and contractor, but also are some of your investors a little bit un, able to ha- swallow those tighter margins, or you were conservative in your underwriting in general? Or Yeah, so conservative in underwriting. Uh, was, I'm obnoxiously conservative with underwriting because I understand the risk involved. Um, I've got models where I'm aggressive, conservative, and then I use essentially right in the middle as, hey, that's going to be our project pro forma. That's what we're going to base everything off of. Um, the way that we've been able to navigate it, um, thankfully, development takes a long time, mm. right? So our ones that are in design and permitting, rates don't really matter to me right now. Right. We're spending money on designing the building. Uh, our 55 units stabilize, so we already have it refinanced. Rates don't really matter. We're in a fixed fixed rate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got a building that we're finishing up that will likely have to plug in uh, some money to get it refinanced, uh, but nothing that tips the project over into you know, bad territory. And I've heard that on a lot of these loans, you're fixed for like maybe five years and then they balloon and then you have to either refinance or sell. Is that the case for all the financing you're getting or do Um, you have some that are longer? Man, I've never had so many different conversations with so many different lenders (laughs) until all Yeah, because I've heard of different things. Commercial is a different world than residential. So many different options. A good example is uh, Fannie had quoted us on our 55 unit uh, fixed rate for 10 years, 10 years I.O., but as a developer, you've got to say, God, do I really want to lock in this rate mm-hmm. for 10 years? Because the prepayment penalty on that type of loan is Ooh. astronomical. Oh. It's 10 years I.O. What are, you talk- what are we talking about for a prepayment penalty? You would have penalty. to pay the remaining interest. <coughs> oh, just pay off the whole, pay off the, the 10 years. Like exactly. whatever you, so you're agreeing to pay 10 years of interest no exactly. matter what. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, in- they got to make your money, right? So yeah. I, I can understand that. And they know that they're offering And they're something. the only one kind of offering that. Right? Yeah, I mean, f- good luck finding two years IO, let alone 10. And so that was really attractive to us, but we took a step back and said, we think rates are gonna come down within five, seven years. Uh, and so we made a commitment on a five-year loan that had uh, three years interest only. Okay, okay. Huh. Yeah, that's a totally different landscape to be looking at. Then. It is, it is. Because <laughs> most of us are just used to the 30-year fix, you know. Yeah, in, in the loan that we locked in for five years, we are allowed to refi it without any prepayment Ooh. if it's with the same bank. Okay, and so, so that was something to us that was okay. attractive, where we're like, hey, if rates come down in 2025 to 4%, let's refi this thing. And it's, it's with them, so they probably don't want to charge you anything additional. They just want to they just your business. Exactly, so. exactly. Hmm. So there's been a lot, and that changes what seems to be weekly at this point. You know, what Fannie offers versus what a bank offers versus what uh, funds are offering, it changes every week on who's more attractive. Hmm. It's lot, a lot to keep up with. <laughs> it's a lot to keep up with during this environment, absolutely. And uh, what is your kind of just lo- overall long-term game? Um, you, you plan to just at some point being able to live off the passive of multiple buildings, or are you going to bu- start building skyscrapers? Like? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. Uh, it would be really cool to do something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our short-term goal, I say short-term, like 7 to 10-year goal is to do maybe about three, 400 million of, of multifamily development. And a lot of that being focused in Portland and uh, we'll definitely expand out of Portland. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, we've got this benefit of being vertically integrated with the construction company. However, that also keeps us in a certain right. pocket, right? Yeah. It's really hard yeah. to move a construction to company to send Seattle. send your construction team somewhere, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so we'll, we'll scale up to a place uh, where we can start acquiring properties that are already stabilized or might have some opportunistic upside. Mm. Um, but that'll that'll be a good seven to ten years out. Cool. Yeah. I mean, well, one quick question too. I mean, you're in Portland. Where else would you go outside of Portland? Like the suburbs, Happy Valley. Would you go out to like? Oh, absolutely. That, yeah. Those areas. Yeah, and we would do that today. I yeah. mean, moving a you know moving a team to Milwaukee, for instance, or Happy Valley. That's not the headache. The headache would be going to like, oh, it's looking Bellevue. Right. Oh yeah. That'd yeah. Be tough. Yeah. Um, I can see that. We like them. Not, I wouldn't say emerging, but growth markets. We mm-hmm. look at Portland like a growth market. We probably would never go to a Los Angeles. Right. Not a lot of growth. Yeah. Um, so that's what we'd be focusing on at that time. That makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and if someone like wanted to contact you because maybe they had the, what you th- they thought was the perfect property, or you know, just wanted to pick your brain, what's a what's a good way to reach out? Are you on Instagram or? Yep. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, Michael Allen A L A N Hamilton. Uh, it's my Instagram handle, uh, or you can email me at michael at senecadevco.com. Great. Well, hey, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, of course. Best of luck in the future. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot.